It's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. For the last four weeks, I've been trying to get us to see Christmas through God's eyes. To remind you, the first week we talked about the light of Christmas and how Jesus was the light of the world, came to be the light of the Christmas. And the second week we talked about the gift, the gift that he was that God sent to us. Last week we talked about the bells and that God rung our bell. And he rung the bell of celebration. He rung the bell of conviction. He rung the bell of conversion because he wants us in his family. It's Christmas time. Today, we're going to talk about the tree. The tree. Now, hit that one more time, Hunter, if you will, because I want you to see Christmas tree the way that they like to see it. There you are. You know, when you think about a Christmas tree, is that there's been a lot of speculation over the years whether the Christmas tree itself had pagan beginnings. I've done it in my research, and there's not enough evidence either way to know if it's Christian or pagan, but since the 16th century, since Martin Luther, that great reformer, uh, lived, he took a tree and he put it in his house because those lights, he wanted them to represent the stars that were on the, mount, uh, the hillside that night when the angels came down to announce the birth of Jesus. I also choose a tree today because most of you have a tree in your house. Hello? It's okay to nod, to shake. Yeah, that's right. Most of us have a tree in our house. Now, we've had a tough November, December. I will tell you the truth, and my wife will brain me back there if she can figure out where to hit me, but we just got our tree out yesterday. So, so we're behind the ball, but, but we love trees. Trees have this way of bringing a, um, fun to us, bringing happiness to us, bringing hope, being, bringing help to us. On this day, I want, to, I want to tell you that my heart is for you to have a, a better Christmas than you have ever had, a more authentic Christmas than you ever had, and I pray that today that it will begin with Jesus in your heart and life. You see, it's possible. <clears throat> it's possible to be in a service like this with the crowd that we have, to sing songs, to hear two wonderful soloists, to hear a message from God's Word. It is possible <clears throat> for us to do all those things and exit the building and miss the real meaning of Christmas. When you look at your tree, I want you to think about some things. That tree does, it's decorated to bring us hope and happiness, joy and peace, goodwill, <clears throat> and even a giving spirit. That's the presence are under it. But I want to suggest to you today that God not had, does not have just one Christmas tree. I want to suggest to you today that God has three Christmas trees. And all three of them have their unique po po uh, position in history, position in my life and your life. And today we're going to begin in Genesis 2, and we're going to go to Revelation 22. Genesis 2. Let me pray for us. And we'll, as we kind of unpack this today, Heavenly Father, we come to you presuming nothing, but we do know that you love us. You've told us that. You've demonstrated that. From the time you created the world to this day, you have demonstrated nothing but your love for us. I pray that today that you will open our eyes that we can see. I pray that you'll open our minds that we can know. I pray that you open our hearts that we can feel you among us. Speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Three trees. The first tree is what I'm calling the tree, the tree of recognition. A tree of recognition. You find it in Genesis chapter 2. If you want to turn there, you can. I'm going to take the screen. Hunter's going to put it up on the screen for me. This is what it says. <clears throat> it says, The Lord God took the man and placed him 
in the Garden of Eden. Now, I'm going to pause there to say he put the man there. Now, this is not a, this is not a male chauvinist thing. That woman had not been designed. She had not been created. She had not been fashioned. She had not been formed. And you go, well, Brother Jerry, why you use all those terms? Because when God created man, the Bible says he scooped up a handful of dust and squeezed it together and said, that's good enough. But it says that when he took the rib from the man and created a woman, he took time and fashioned a woman. Men, aren't you glad that he kind of fashioned them? I thought so, yeah. He knew what he was doing. The Lord God took the man, placed him in the Garden of Eden, watch this, to work it and watch over it. Now, men, let me just tell you, you have your, you have your purpose in life, to work it and to watch over it. You find it right here in Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden. If you were to back up just a few verses, probably verses 7, 8, and 9, you'll discover that God put many trees in the garden. And he said you could eat of all of them. And evidently they were all fruit trees. You know, I can imagine in the garden that there were apples and oranges and bananas and pears and uh, um, figs. I also think there was a persimmon tree there myself. But he only named two of them, by the way. He only, out of all the trees, he only named two. And he said, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now we're going to leave that scripture there just for a second. Because we know our history, we know our Bible, we know that when they ate it, that their, that their spirit really died at that point. You see, the, the truth is, this is the tree that challenges us. We must recognize that this is a tree that God put there. He really put it there for our benefit. But when we didn't do what he said for us to do, some things happened. When you come to this tree, let me tell you three things that you need to recognize. First of all, you need to recognize sovereign God. You need to recognize sovereign God. Now, some of you are sitting there going, well, hmm, Brother Jerry... How does recognizing sovereign God factor into a baby in a manger, this thing that we call Christmas? How does the tree of the knowledge of good and evil bring us to this point? And here's why. Here's why that this first thing is the most important. Your tree of recognition and that you have to recognize sovereign God. Watch this. We don't know much of this on the creek. But you guys who are about to graduate high school this year, years to come, if you don't go to a Christian university, you know what, you know what you're going to be taught there? You're going to be taught there that God is a fairy tale. You're going to be taught there that God is a myth. You're going to be taught there that this book is full of fairy tales. You go, when you say, well, it's God's Word, and they go, why do you believe it? And you go, well, it's in the Bible. They're going to go, well, that's nothing but just a book. Give me some evidence. Well, let me just tell you, You'll hear more about this in the spring. But this is why it's important for us to recognize sovereign God. Back when the, when the universe began, God was the uncaused cause to begin the universe. You can't go back further than God. Philosophers will say, well, what was before that? It, nothing has to be before that. Because He is sovereign. He designed it. When you recognize him as sovereign God, he is creator. He is designer. He is the one who authored it. He's the one that wrote the rules. Serves for us to be a reminder that the one who writes it is the one who maintains it. He is the one. Now listen, he is the one that makes the determinations about good and bad, right and wrong, sin and righteousness. We don't get to do that. If we're going to have an outstanding celebration of Christmas and life, we begin right here with who he is. Oh, folks, we may get together with family. Oh, no. We will get together with family. We will eat good food. We will exchange presents. We will have a lot of laughs. 
and, and we will drink our ale and our coffee and everything else that we can fix that we'll drink, and we'll have a great time. You can have a great time, but listen, until we settle the question about sovereign God, we will have little to no clarity for eternity. And how does that affect us? After almost 50 years behind the pulpit as a music director or a pastor, I can tell you unequivocally, some of the meanest people I have ever met attend church. Now here's the thing. They attend church and they give no evidence with their life that they've ever encountered the living Lord. And so you know what that makes them? It makes them miserable because they've got one foot in the world, one foot in the church. They're miserable in both. And I can tell you why they're miserable. <laughs> All you farmers know why. Because on your farm, if you get straddled of something, you're never happy. You see, we have to settle this question about who's in charge, who's authority, and he's the one that said, you need not eat off this tree. You need to recognize who he was. Recognizing God is vital if you're going to have a life of meaning and purpose and happiness and fulfillment and contentment. By the way, this tree is his gift to us because we have to recognize who he is. The second thing, that we need to recognize, we need to recognize Satan. <laughs> you can scoot over in chapter 3 for that. All of us, now please listen. If you're not going to listen to any other part of the message today, listen to this part. All of us are just like the woman. And we hear Satan whispering in her ear, did God really say? Did God really say? At the same time, do you remember what Jesus told you and me? He said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. So what does it say? Here's what it says. We have to recognize who Satan is and recognize Jesus, who Jesus is so we can discern, so we can, so we can differentiate between those two voices. You want me to prove it to you? <clears throat> If quite likely there is someone in this room right now and you're hearing this voice, man, this is Christmas. Don't pay attention to what this old man's, don't pay attention to the message of this old man who's up there talking about an old story that, that's no longer relevant. Don't, you don't, well, let me just tell you something. If you've, got a, if you've got something like that pulling you and pulling you away from this message, you can be assured that it's not God. You can be assured that that voice is the voice of Satan. You see, Satan asked the question, did God really say, in the shadow of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Let's put it, it's Genesis 3, I think it's going to be up here, yeah. Now the serpent, <laughs> don't you like that? Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the, I love this designation, wild animals. He was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, here it is, did God really say, did he really say you can't eat from the, any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, here she is getting defensive, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle or the midst of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. And some people will say, well, they didn't physically die. No, but they, their relationship with God died. Their spirit died at the moment they ate it. Satan, here he goes. No, you will not surely die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, here's the, here's the kick. The woman saw that the tree was good for food 
and delightful. Let me just pause there. Was good for food. That's the opposite of what God had said. And then he said, and delightful to look at. Well, can I just tell you something? Everything that's delightful to look at is not good for you or is not right. James said, speaks of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It always had your wrong direction. And that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. For me, that sounds like America 2023. Everything that God said don't do, she did. She entertained it. She saw it. All of a sudden, what God said, don't look at, she looked at, and it was delightful, and it was desirable. And then the scripture that's up there says, and then she took it, ate of it. She wasn't satisfied doing it for herself. She gave it to her husband. Now, men, let me just tell you something. Adam was not on the other side of the garden while this was going on. He was standing there watching her. And he went silent, and she fell into sin because of his silence. In fact, Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you know, the woman was deceived, but the man went in with his eyes open. You see, the, the truth is, is that when we are drawn into the thinking that Eve had, we fail to recognize Satan. Even on a day like this, even on Christmas Eve, when we're ready to celebrate Jesus' birthday, Satan is still standing at the tree. The tree is found in your life. And he's still asking, did God really say? He's still trying to lure you and pull you to think like he wants you to think. And the question is, how do we respond? Do we recognize whose voice this is? Do we recognize sovereign God and the hope that he offers? The first couple, they fail to recognize sovereign God for who he is and for, and for the protections. His, 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 his commands were not for their detriment. It was for their protection. Just like his commands today is for our protection. They didn't recognize sovereign God and they didn't recognize Satan. They failed to recognize sovereign God. They failed to recognize Satan. So you know what? They failed. At the tree of recognition, we need to recognize sovereign God and we need to recognize that other personage, Satan, and the third thing that we need to recognize there, we need to recognize sin. Now, did you just grasp, gasp, sin? You're going to talk about sin on Christmas Eve? Why would you even mention such a word? Here's why. Without sin, there's no reason for Christmas. Without sin, there's no reason for God to send his son to be our savior from our sin. Without sin, there's no reason for Jesus to come in a manger. Why do we have to recognize sin? Can I just give you two quick reasons? First of all, sin separates us from God. God is holy, we're not. Do I have to convince anybody in this room that I and you are sinners? The Bible tells us that all have sinned. The Bible tells us that there's none righteous. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. The Bible tells us there's a, that sin creates a chasm between us and God. Sin separates us from God. And the Bible tells us that the only payment for that sin is blood. It's blood. And we can't pay the price for our sin. The truth is, is that if you have never invited Christ into your life, if you've never trusted him for the forgiveness of your sin, today could be the day. But I want to say this for those who have trusted Christ. Make no mistake, sin can creep, creep back in your life and build a chasm between you and God, a chasm that you cannot cross. 
But here's what I want you to, to, to realize, because this is what we need to hear in the 21st century America. You do not get to define sin. You don't get to say what's right and wrong, good, bad. God has already done it right here in his book. Well, Brother Jerry, I don't like what it says. You know, I don't like what it says about abortion. I don't like what it says about homosexuality. I don't like what it says about immorality. I don't like what it says about lying. I don't like what it says about cheating. I don't like what it says about stealing. I don't like what it says about a whole myriad of things. You may not like it, but you don't get to change it. If I don't, you know what I don't like? I've told you before. I don't like the fact that Jesus, the baby in the manger, had to go to the cross to save my soul. Another reason you need to recognize sin, child of God, is because when you sin, Hebrews 6 tells us you crucified Jesus all over. I just, you need to contemplate that on a Christmas. Do I crucify Jesus again? The tree of recognition. The second tree that I see in the Bible is found in all the Gospels. It's the tree of redemption. We're going to, we're going to look at, at Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15 is where that we're going to read. And obviously, Jesus is at the cross. And I want to tell you, Jesus is, Jesus is going to the cross... The cross was not simply Jesus' destination. It was his destiny. The very reason he left heaven and came to earth, the very reason he came through a manger was to go to the cross. Here's what it says. Got a couple of passages here we're just going to pull out. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. You can see that today uh, in the Holy Land. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh. Now, I just pause there to say, uh, um, Shannon, I meant to ask you this today. For me, as I read that, uh, they were trying to anesthetize him or give him some kind of drug that would make him, you know those drugs that doctors like to give us where we don't care. It's not that it knocks us out. We just don't care. That's what they were trying to do with that wine and myrrh. But he did not take it. These four words should shudder you. Then they crucified him. You realize how much power is in those words? They laid him down on that cross member. And they took what we would call a railroad spike. And I know in our... In our um, in our emotional way we look at this, we think yeah, they put the nail right there, but if they'd have put the nail right there, his hand would have just ripped off. Quite likely, they put it right here between the radius and the ulna so it would hold the body. And they put it right there because right in that wrist are a whole bunch of nerves. And not only was it painful going in, but every time he moved, his hands were like electricity. And then they crossed his legs, probably putting that nail somewhere right at the ankle where it, where it sits, where, the, where the, uh, the bone sits right on the ankle. It's painful. It wasn't about death. It was about pain, suffering. They crucified Jesus and divided his clothes, casting lot for them to decide what each would get. Now... It was 9 in the morning when they crucified him. Now you scoot down to verse 37. Now it's at 3 o'clock. Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Then the curtain of the temple. This is wonderful. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Why is that important? Because the, court, the curtain of the temple in those days kept the common man, kept you and me away from where the Holy of Holies was. where Only the, only the priests could enter. And it's as if when Jesus was crucified, it's as if God took the top of that curtain and he ripped it apart to open the way for us to come to him. When the centurion was standing 
and saw the way that he breathed his last, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. As you, I want to just give you this picture. As you view the cross. Now, this is not an authentic picture of the cross. They've cleaned it up, dressed it up. First of all, this is a, a nice, smooth cross. The writer had it right when he called it an old rugged cross. Quite likely those rugged members, the stipes and the patibulum, were blood-stained because of people who had been crucified before. When you look at this cross, don't just see a man dying. See a man dying for you. For you see, back to what I was saying earlier, if we died for our own sin, if we had to pay the price for our own sin, if we had to shed the blood for our own sin, we would never be able to enjoy heaven. I look at that cross and I think of this tree of redemption. Our Christmas trees are always pretty. The true cross was a bloody mess to those who don't know. That's why they said the preaching of the cross is foolishness. But for us who have been to the cross and who Jesus has redeemed, saved our soul, saved our sin, guaranteed us a home in heaven, for that person, this picture should be a picture of God's love. That he let his son endure this cross. On the cross, let me just tell you three things quickly that he did. He, he reconciled us. He reconciled us. That reconciliation or reconcile is largely an accounting term. It means to bring in harmony, to bring in balance. You see, we are out of God's will. We are out of, his, out of balance with him because we're sinful creatures and he's a holy creature. We are his creation. And he brought us in harmony with himself. And not only did he bring us in harmony, but if you read Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he talks about this ministry of reconciliation, bringing into harmony. That's what we've been given. Jesus reconciled us. But the second thing he did, when he reconciled us, then he reclaimed us. He reclaimed us. He created us. We were created in the Garden of Eden to walk with God forever and ever. Because of our sin, we are now estranged from God. The Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That's why we can't redeem ourselves. Jesus came to shed his blood, to pay the price. And it all began at Christmas time. The Bible tells us Christ died once. The godly for the ungodly, so that he might redeem us, he might reclaim us, he might reconcile us to God. And in that reconciliation process, he restored us into his family, restored us into his family. I want to say this to you because we all love our families, and we consider the family on earth our blood family. Because we are born of our genetics and what have you. But I'm just telling you something. If you're in Christ, your blood family here on earth will not be your family one day. You can be mad at the preacher on Christmas Day. That's fine. It will not be your family one day when you get beyond the grave. But the family that you have in Jesus will be your family for time and eternity. Family that never goes away. I don't know if you've ever had a family member to be estranged. Probably some of you have. A crowd this size. Somebody's had a child to go off the reservation. Our daughter went off the reservation. We've not been secretive about it. Today, 20 years later, she's a wonderful mother of five. I think maybe it affected her, her head to have five children. I'm, I'm kidding. But I remember it was not a long time as I look back now, but it seemed like an eternity when Christy was gone. 
she'd go, we lived in Biloxi, and she was in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, in college. And for a solid week, we didn't know where she was. Called the highway patrol. Called local morgues. Anybody we could find. We finally found her. She was herself. But she was alive. And I remember how that restoration was. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Even though my heart beats right now, <laughs> this, this Williams... A valve that they put in his heart is, is pumping right now because I remember that and it's such an emotional time. That doesn't touch this when God restores us into his family. There's one more tree here. Tree of recognition, we've seen the tree. We've seen the tree of recognition and the tree of redemption. This is my favorite tree. It's the tree of Revelation. And you find it all the way back in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. We're going to read the first five verses. Then he showed me. Then he showed me the river of water of life, clear as crystal. Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. We're talking about heaven here. Then the tree of life was on each side of the river. How does that happen? Man, that's beyond my mind. Bearing 12 kinds of fruit. One tree bearing 12 kinds of fruit. Producing its fruit every month. Farmers, aren't you jealous? The leaves of the trees are for healing the nations. And there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their forehead. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of a sun because the, lo the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Christmas trees you look at give you hope and gives you happiness and give you joy and peace and favor and more. This tree of Revelation gives us exactly the same thing. This tree is a promise for things to come for eternity. It's found in the midst of the water. It's, and look at that, the tree, the tree of life that was first talked about in the garden and later in the prophets and now after the end of the world is still available. I'm just going to give you I'm going to give these to you in bullet points <clears throat> for the sake of time. Three things that we can find here at the tree of Revelation. First of all is everlasting light, and then everlasting worship, and then eternal healing. Now let me just, let me just say that, whoa, I guess that everlasting light went somewhere, didn't it? Everlasting light. It's it's a light that's vibrant. It's like your Christmas tree lights on steroids. It's vibrant. It's flashing. Here's what I'm going to tell you it does for you today. It takes you from the place of darkness to the place of light. Everlasting light. Everlasting worship. Do you realize that you and I are created to worship? We are created to worship. Now, when I say worship, everybody looks at Eric because I don't know when music got to be the only thing we worship with. Music is something we can worship with, but music is not worship by itself, nor does it guarantee worship. Chances are we're going to do some singing up there. We're going to do some worship. Everybody in this room is a worshiper of something, of something. Worship is whatever you give your heart to. Some of us in this room today, we worship our jobs we worship our bank accounts. We worship our 401ks. We worship our sports team. We worship our hobbies. And we give them all of who we are, and then we give God just a little bit of what's left over. You see, we're all created to worship. Scripture tells us, and I could go back and read it, that there we will worship forever. And then it speaks of the eternal healing. 
The leaves are for the healing. Only God could do this. In the baptistry today, we saw a picture of God's healing two times. Where a young man was healed physically. And then he was healed spiritually. You see, today, if you're going to have a great Christmas, it's going to be because you understand the impact of these three trees in your life. <clears throat> and every time you look at that tree, you remember the baby. Every time when you go in that house this afternoon, when you go home, when you look at your Christmas tree, remember the baby. Now, oh, man, gosh, i got to recognize who God is. I have to remember who Satan is, and, and I have to know what sin is. Recognition. Redemption. Wow, that... That he reconciled me. That he reclaimed me. That he restored me. And one day, I will see God in person and he'll be that evanescent light. And I will offer him my everlasting worship. And he eternally will heal me. But it begins today. One of my favorite preachers in the world right now is a guy named Greg Laurie. I really wish this was about a tree, but it's not. But it sure does remind us of, of, what, of what Christmas is all about. He tells a story about a couple, a family who were getting ready to go off on vacation. They had all their luggage packed, had, to, had um, the luggage in the SUV. The kids had taken the dog over to the neighbors to take care of them. They'd punched in the GPS in their phone to get ready to go. They all piled in the vehicle, and they raced down the road, and they were almost out of town when Mom said, Stop! I know what happens when Deborah says stop. She forgot something. And Dad looked at the wife and said, oh, What's wrong? She goes, We forgot the baby. I can tell you, we've had some friends that we were in church with, good friends, and they did forget their baby at the house one time. But here's what I want to tell you. Greg goes on to say this. He said, that story is the epitome of what I see happening in the United States of America today. We make our list. We check it twice. <laughs> we shop till we drop. We put decorations up. We go to programs and and uh, uh, pageants and parties. Then it dawns on us. We've forgotten the baby. Brothers and sisters, this Christmas make it special because you don't forget the baby. When you look at the tree, think of the baby. Let's pray together.